do you know what, we're going to get some of the kids come up in the next couple of weeks, maybe next week, and we're going to get them to share the words that they've been hearing from God. You know, little Jacob, when he gets here, he's been having a real uh, close time with the Lord, a real encounter hearing his voice. We've had stories of dreams, we've had stories of words of knowledge. And we just want the kids just to pour into the house. And if so, if you're young, you know, and you think, well, I'm only a youth or kid, and you hear God speak, be bold. I want you to come to the front and I want you to tell me that you're hearing God speak. And we'll release you to release it. Because this isn't about grown-ups doing it. This is about us as a family of God hosting his presence as a family. From the very oldest to the very youngest. Isn't that good? So before we get into worship, I just want to uh, focus our hearts for an encounter with the living God. You know he's alive, right? You know, they tried to kill him. But three days later, he was risen again, sin defeated, sickness defeated, oppression defeated. Sounds like I'm the only one excited by this. There is resurrection power in the house of God because Jesus is in the house of God. And do you know what? Jesus, he didn't stay in the grave. He didn't just come up and then die again. He ascended to the very highest of heights and was given the ultimate seat of honor. And he was given a name above every name. So no matter... What scenario you're facing, what's happening in your body, what's happening in your finances, what's happening in your relationships, there is a name that's above every single one of those situations. And it says it, call on the name of the Lord that you may be saved. The word salvation is healing to your spirit, soul and body. And in this house we have an expectation that when we call on the name of the Lord, he makes himself known. And his presence changes everything. I want to make this decree this morning. Eternity is about to touch your heart and it's going to mark you for the rest of your life. I genuinely believe the Holy Spirit is realigning our hearts so that we can run in the fullness that God has for us. That's the beauty of the cross. We don't stop at the cross. It's a doorway to go into a life that you were always created for. I came to give you life and life abundantly. Isn't that wonderful? So today, anything that looks like death or doesn't look like life is going to be turned around and God is going to mark you with his abundant life. Incredible. So I want to share the scripture for you. It's going to be on the screen for you. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 5. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and of the powers of the age to come. Now he's actually talking about people who have fallen away from God and he's talking about this is what you left behind. But if they left it behind, it's what they had in the first place. And I want to focus your hearts that you would come into an awareness that you have something in your possession and you have this. You have an enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. He has illuminated your heart. He is the light of the world that we were walking in darkness before Christ and he illuminated our lives with his goodness and that goodness turned our lives around, caused us to repent and said, oh God, I no longer want to live for me, I want to live for you. Isn't that wonderful? That's what enlightenment does. He then says that you have tasted the heavenly gift. That is an experiential knowledge that he is so good that you can do nothing to remove yourself from the love of God. There is no sin, no demon, no past, no history that can ever disqualify you from the love of God. That's how good he is. John 1 says that the flesh became tabernacled in flesh and the world didn't know it, but he still went to the cross for it. For the joy set before him, he endured death, even death on a cross. Why? So that he could call you a child of God. Isn't that awesome? You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You just have to receive it. It's a free gift this morning. But you get to taste that he is good. And I want to tell you, if you've never given your life to Christ this morning, your life can change so radically that you won't recognize yourself. Because he is going to take what doesn't belong to you anymore, all of the guilt, all of the shame that comes through failures and condemnation. I want to tell you this. He is able to take the grubbiest life and make it as pure and as righteous and as white as snow that you can ever imagine. And you go, well, that sounds too good to be true. Taste and see that God is good. He is too good for you to even understand. You can't even get to the limits of how good God is. And that's why he's going to heal you this morning. And that's why your body is going to come into health and wholeness. It's why your soul's 
those who've been struggling with anxiety and depression, that spirit is leaving off your life today because there's a new spirit making a home in you. He's the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? This is the gospel. Whew. He's illuminated you. You've had an experience of this heavenly gift. You've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you this. Jesus said, I'm going to go, and it's good for me to go, so that I can actually send you a helper. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can be in the middle of Siberia, and you still have all of heaven with you. It is impossible for you to be alone. That when you give your life to Christ, your spirit man that comes alive is sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force, he's not a power, he's not an atmosphere, he is a person of the Trinity who is the very fullness that Jesus was, who is the very fullness of who the Father is. Inside you lives the very fullness of God. What does that mean? The one who spake, spoke, let there be light, he lives in you. The one who's able to restore limbs and spit into mud and put it into the eyes and create. He lives inside of you. The one who offers bread and fish to the Lord and says, I bless it. And it feeds 4,000, then 5,000 men plus women and children. He lives inside of you. So that tells me that resident on the inside of every believer is accepting Christ Jesus as their Lord. He doesn't just want it to be a confession. It is a moving in of God. And he isn't just bringing a suitcase. He's bringing heaven with him. So heaven reigns on the inside of you. And your life starts to be changed a lot like heaven. Wow. Huh. Why does no one join church? This is Jesus. You have tasted the good word. You've tasted the good word. That word there is, in the Greek, the rhema word. It is the now, living and active word. Said about Jesus that he is the word of God. I want to tell you, God is speaking this morning. And he's going to speak to your heart. And he's going to get past all of your thinking, all of your history, all of your traditions. And he's going to speak life into you. And you're going to be able to taste that word. And I promise you, when God speaks something, it never returns void. It always achieves what it was set out to do. You need to know that God is speaking to you this morning and that your life can change. Open your hearts, there will be good soil. Then there will be 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit on what God has for your life. The Word of God is producing in you. And then we have the God and the powers of the age to come. What is the age to come? It is heaven on earth. You need to know that when you give your life to Christ, you no longer just have a birthday and a death day. That's not it. But eternity has already kick-started. That what you do today isn't just playing out for the rest of your life. It is playing out for the whole of eternity. When you release a song of praise, all of heaven is hearing it and it echoes. Creating an echo changer in heaven where actually the Lord of glory is receiving your praise. And it's like a fragrance that's offered up to him. And he says to the angels, he says, have a look at these ones. Their hearts have been opened. It says that they long to know about the things of salvation. You have something that angels don't even have. You know what it's like to be disconnected and then be reconnected back to the Father through the offering of King Jesus. So when you worship, guess who's also listening to you? The angelic. I want to tell you there are more angels in this room than there are people. It's about time the church starts being a supernatural house of God where eternity breaks into the temple, where heaven breaks into earth. That's why people get healed. That's why people hear his voice. Because Jesus, who is the eternal king of glory, comes and abides with his people. He said, where two or more are gathered, he is there in and amongst them. You may not see him with his eyes, but when you shut your eyes and you engage with the heart of God, he begins to touch you and change you and transform you in a way you never would have been able to prepare for. That's the grace of God on your life. Isn't that wonderful? What am I doing? I'm trying to build faith for you before you start singing songs. No Christian karaoke here. It's an encounter with the most living God. You need to move the chairs out of the way, put your face on the floor. That's what you do. The Holy Spirit is about to flood you with his goodness. So there is going to be the power of the age to come flowing through this house this morning. I want to even speak to knees even now and just say, be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Elbows where there's aching in the elbow, be healed in Jesus' name. And when you go through worship, you're going to start to move and find out that you've been healed. Come tell me when it happens. 
But how is all this possible? Jesus said yes to a mission to lay down the glory that he had for all of eternity past. Before there was ever heaven or earth, Jesus was one with the Father. Holy Spirit was one with those as well. And he said yes to the mission to humble himself that he would come as a lowly babe, to be born in a stable, in poverty, in rejection, in all of that stuff, so that he could buy back what was lost by mankind. You know, Adam and Eve were created in the absolute perfection of God. They were made in the very image of God, and God said to them, I'm going to give you dominion and authority to rule in the earth, and he trusted them because they thought like him. And he knew that they would do it in exactly the same way as he did. But they listened to another voice that came in. Some people are hearing other voices this morning. I want to tell you, that voice is about to be silenced by the blood of Jesus. It's going to go. That thought of suicide, whoever that is, is going today and it's ending. And as soon as Adam and Eve, they listened to the voice and they let go of everything that God had given them. At that moment... A prophetic word was released to the devil that said there is going to be one who is born of a woman and he is going to bruise his heel because he smashes your head so hard into the ground that he's going to defeat everything that you ever tried to do against mankind. War and against God. I want to tell you that the devil is not an equal opponent to God. He is a defeated foe because of the cross of Christ. The blood of Jesus destroys every work of the enemy. And so Jesus said yes to the mission to be born as a humble baby, to grow up in the life of being a human being with every emotion, every temptation, things like grief and sorrow, things like being rejected by your friends, all of that stuff he experienced so that he could say, I know what you're going through, but I know that there is a way to life. And he was so committed to it that as a sinless sacrifice, he said yes to be our scapegoat. He said yes to have all of our sins put on him and then him put up on the cross and become a curse and sin for us. He did that because he was looking through the ages, through the eyes of eternity, and he was able to see that I was going to be stood here today talking about him. That Lauren's here, that Rob's there, that you know Josh is there, all here because of the work of Jesus. And he went, for the joy set before me, I'm going to say yes to the cross, that one day there will be a people who declare who I am, and everything that was lost in the Garden of Eden is restored back to order that heaven will be to dwell in earth again, that no longer does suffering and pain and anguish have to be your portion, but you can live in the very centre of God's heart because Jesus paid the price for you. This is the gospel. I hope that you start lifting the roof off when we worship because he's that good. Huh. I didn't mean to do this. This here is our doorway. We've got a word for 2024, that this is an era of an open door. I want to tell you that Jesus is the door. He said he's the door. He's the one that leads into the Father. And we're going to come together in worship, but before we do that, we're going to acknowledge the death of Jesus Christ, the sacrificing of his body, and the shedding of his blood. Would you just stand with me, because this is an act of worship. We've already started worship, by the way. <laughs> I believe people get healed by taking communion, by the way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we want to thank you for your body that was broken for us. I want to thank you that your broken body is the torn veil that opened the door for us to come into your presence. We thank you that this is more than just a symbol, it is supernatural. 
that as we take it this morning, Lord, that you take us deeper into the revelation of who you are, that as we eat this bread, our eyes are open to see you rightly, and that a new depth of love is birthed in our hearts, that we would give you everything that you deserve. We thank you, Lord, for that you hung on a tree to take every curse off our lives, every limited blessing, that we would be able to step into the fullness of blessing in Christ Jesus. I want to thank you that it's by your stripes that you received by the Roman guards that we are healed, that every lashing of Jesus was purchasing for healing for our bodies and healing for our souls in Jesus' name. I also want to prophesy to you that there is healing even coming between you and your children and you and your spouses in the name of Jesus because the body was torn to break the curse. Jesus, we thank you for your body. We receive it in thanksgiving and praise. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Oh, we thank you for the power of the blood. Shh. Ephesians 1 says this, that we have been raised up in Christ Jesus with access to every spiritual blessing by how we've been adopted as sons through the blood of Jesus. I want to thank you that this blood cleans every soul. I don't care where you've been in your life. I don't care how grubby or how dark you think your life got, how poor your decisions. I want to tell you that there is a blood that cleans every single one of those. And it is an eternal transaction. It is immediate when you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. I want to thank you that your blood washes us white as snow. I want to thank you that your blood breaks every chain, every curse. I want to thank you that your blood becomes my blood. I want to thank you that your life is in the blood, that as we drink this, that your life begins to flow through us. I pray that that would be like a torrential river flowing through our veins this morning, that we know that we are one in you because the blood marks us as the family of God, adopted as sons with an inheritance and sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your blood. And the house of God says, Amen. Amen. So Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come flood this house with the abundance of the cross. We pray, Father, that you would open our eyes. We pray for prophetic pictures and leading of your presence. Do what we couldn't even expect is possible for you to do. And the house of God said, in faith and expectation, Amen. Jesus, we are
through a worshiping, I was just coming off the back of what Luke shared, just sensing that in the house there's people that have forgotten what it is to actually be in the presence of God. That there's been a distraction that's come into your life that has focused you on material things, possessions, building your own empire really. And you've forgotten what it is to be a kingdom people. You've forgotten that this isn't about us, it's about the king and his kingdom. It's not about us prospering, it's not about us looking good, it's about the king and his kingdom. And I'm just sensing that the Holy Spirit is saying that he wants to reignite and realign people in this house this morning to be a people that would serve the king and manifest his kingdom. So if that's you in this place, I'm not going to call you forward in this moment right now. And let me say, there's no embarrassment for that. There's no condemnation for that. I'm guilty of that from time to time. The Lord continually has to realign me when I go off down the path that he has put me on. But if that's you, if that's ministering to you this morning, if you're recognizing that I need to be set on fire again, my heart needs to be reignited this morning, so I'm a person that serves the king and his kingdom. We're going to invite you, and there's a, there's, a, there's a prophetic move of when you step out from where you are, from where you're seated, and you come into a new place. There's a signaling of that that you're giving to the spiritual that I'm not happy with where I am at this morning. I want to come into a new place, a new place where the king is and where his kingdom is. So if that's you this morning, if that's ministry to you this morning, we'd like to invite you as the worship goes on to come forward and get prayed for, to get reignited to get set on fire, to present your body again as a living sacrifice upon the altar and feel the fire of God. In Jesus' name. That's scary if he needs fire enough. <laughs> i tell you what, we are at a moment of encounter at this point. You know, we've just been singing, hallelujah means praise the Lord. And as we were singing that, I was seeing probably about five, ten minutes ago, I saw a red carpet being rolled out. And it wasn't a red carpet for us to come, it was a red carpet for him to come. And then I heard the phrase about what's happening now is that we're repairing a highway of praise. And I have to go to Google, it's my second one after the Holy Spirit, to find this verse. <laughs> Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Sing hallelujah to him. Cast up a highway for him who rides through the deserts. Extol his name. Exalt his name. Because what happens when we lift up Jesus high, Jesus lifts all up to himself. He draws men into himself. And there's something significant that can happen in this moment. And there'll be other moments, but this moment here about reigniting. What does a desert represent? It represents a place where life isn't growing and where the river ain't flowing. And so God wants to start to release life and fruitfulness and a river that flows in the desert places. He says, I will turn the dry places into a river. It says that though we walk through the valley of Raqqa, that dry place, that valley of weeping, wherever they set their foot, it will turn into pools of water and then the rains of heaven will come. The Holy Spirit is ministering something in this moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to move some chairs back. Because there ain't enough room for people to come down, but you need to move. And if you feel like, oh God, you're pulling on my heart, that I need more than this. That, Lord, there are deserts there that I just need a touch from the refreshing rain of your presence. I want you to come and we're going to go back into hallelujah. And something's going to happen in the realm of your heart that there is a red carpet being laid out. Who walks on red carpets? Kings walk on red carpets. And the king of glory, this is you saying, oh, fling wide, you heavenly gates. Oh, let the king of glory come in. And I want to tell you, if you're sick, if you're in anguish, 
come as well because God can flood through your life and see change. And so we just need to get out of this chairs thing, you know. Come, express your heart to him. Come and just bring a place. You need to be on your knees, be on your knees. You need to be on your face. You need to scream, dance, shout, whatever it is. But don't let this window pass you by. Holy Spirit, let a river flood through this house in Jesus' name.
desperate for needing to meet with God, it was an absolute need to meet with God today. To meet with the person of Jesus. And what I'm seeing is it's as though you've been spending time in the backside of the desert, you're not even in the fringe of the desert. And this morning, you're coming to your burning bush moment where you see something and feel something that pull it and it's causing you to turn aside. I see you even last night saying, God, tomorrow I need to see you and I need to meet with you. And I just see like tears coming on your pillow. I saw a river coming and meeting you in that place. And real deep down underneath all of that desert, there were these seeds that were generations old and as the river began to flow over it, what would be decreed for your life, through the generations, the seed was suddenly activated and life starts to be seen. I believe the Lord is trying to restore a hope to you where you have been bound by hopelessness to the point where you feel like you've been trapped in chains of darkness and the Lord is saying, turn aside. I have sown hope in you though you didn't see it I've been bringing you to this place Holy Spirit we just minister the waters of life right now in the name of Jesus let there be rivers flowing out of your innermost being. Rivers, not one, rivers. Ah. Holy Spirit, just come and do what you want to do right now. We'll wait for you. Yes, rivers. flow into marriage this morning. Hmm. Let the river flow into your finances this morning. Let the river make way for you for new opportunities this morning. Let the river flow and heal your body this morning. Heal your soul this morning. truth about this is with rivers is the firmer they flow the faster they get I just speak increase Holy Spirit increase this morning as we just push in as we wait upon your presence as we lift up Jesus Holy Spirit come do something even greater than we're even expecting right now Holy Spirit we just give you authority in this house right now oh the one who is the power come and release Lord the reality of heaven. Holy Spirit, come like a flood. Come like a flood. Come like a flood. In Jesus' name.
It's okay for you to take hold of the kingdom of God violently. For the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. I want to give you permission. It's okay for you to be a warrior in the house of God. To be a father in the house of God. To have a voice in the house of God. Oh. Ha. Jesus is known as the Lord of hosts. He oversees an army. Ha. I want to release the authority that you would have authority in your own homes. Divine order coming. That you would be able to flourish in who he has created you to be. As husbands. As fathers. And as sons of the King of Glory. Jesus. I speak over your children. That there will be a spirit of wisdom that rests upon their mouths. Out of the mouths of babes will many truths be spoken. There is direction coming to your families out of your children's dreams and out of your children's impressions from the Lord. Turn your ear to them.
which affects, if any of you had it, it's severe, quite severe pain, really, and it affects your mobility. But anyway, I tested it out before we prayed, and I'd still got pain as touching it. When we tested it later on, when we were down here, uh, there's just no pain. There is no pain. Oil, boys. 
You got to lost one eye, I'm saying. Once you pray for him, get him to check it out. If he's not done, pray for him again. We're going to try and see breakthrough in that area. That needs to go. In particular, guys, can you just rebuke trauma as well off the knee in Jesus' name? Huh. If you think it looks like I don't know what to do, it's because I don't know what to do. <laughs> My voice is going. <clears throat> what I love about what's happening here, and hear my heart, I'm not saying it's presence church, it's what the Lord is doing in the land. There are other people like us. There is a roar that is coming out from the people where they say we don't want to just do the status quo, we don't want to do church as normal, we want the real deal. Either he says he's with us or he's not. And it's not good enough for me to say, oh, he's with me, and then never to experience it. Because he said, taste and see that God is good. I actually talked about every time about the knowledge of God is actually about contact experience. In other words, I touched him and he's touched me. The easiest way of doing that is that we touch him with our hearts as we overflow in worship. And that's why what you've seen happen this morning has just happened as an overflow because there is a contact experience with the presence of God. He is called Jesus. And he is alive, and he is touching his people by his spirit. He is leading those who don't know him to know him and see him rightly so that he can just do in their lives what he's doing in us. Isn't that a glorious God, right? I can worship a God like that. I really can. Jesus. I dare tell my wife we've only just finished worship. She's down with the kids. <laughs> Thanks, worship, guys. Oh, wow, where do you want to go in Holy Spirit? Wow. <clears throat> I do feel that just that word there, that sign that was on Amy about marking people for revival. This house is here for revival. It was what we were told to prepare for. He said, prepare a house for my glory to dwell, that people would be able to come and encounter him. And all we're seeing is the limitations and our traditions just breaking off all the time and we find ourselves like moving chairs out of the way, which isn't a big deal in the grand scheme of eternity, but for some people, when they've got their chair, that's a big deal, right? And so God is really preparing our hearts. He's turning the ground over and he's putting seeds in and every time we come into his presence, there is just a watering of those seeds. And I would just be saying to you, in this environment, with what he is doing at this time like this, even more so, open your ears for discernment to hear his voice. I heard someone once say, it's never a good time to backslide. It's really a bad time to backslide when God's about to break out in a city. You know, for me, I love the idea that God is coming to localise himself. His glory will be made known by himself. We know the earth is full of God's glory, but the knowledge of the glory of the Lord isn't yet known. So as the body of Christ, as the... Uh, church, we are the gateway for heaven to break into the earth. We're the gateway for eternity to break into the temporal realm, that those things that are unseen become manifest and we realise they're more real than the stuff that we taste, touch, see, hear, etc. There is a world that is more real than the one we're in right now. And that's why in the room I could feel just the uh, presence of heaven with the angelic just active all the way through. Why? Because they've been sent as ministering spirits to those who've inherited salvation. Some of you were feeling wind go by. Who was feeling that? Just like a rush of wind. Okay, two people there. Some of you were feeling like the heat just come past, and it wasn't the heaters because they're not blow heaters. Okay, it's just like it was like just coming past you. But it says that his messengers are like wind and fire. And so the angelic realm is there over and in the church. Jesus said in John 2, when he sent I think it was Philip to go get Nathaniel. And uh, he says to him, he's going to be sat on the tree, go grab him for me, I want to have a conversation with him. So he's coming and uh, he sees Nathaniel and says, Oh, there's a man who's got no guile. There's no deceit in him. He is what he is. He's proper stoking, right? He says what he thinks. And uh, Nathaniel's like, How on earth did you know that? And he says, Well, don't you know that I actually saw you under the tree? He's absolutely mind blown. And he says, Listen, that is nothing with comparison to what you're about to see. You're about to see 
angels ascended and descended upon the Son of Man, where they're taking the resource of heaven and releasing them into the earth. And Jesus is basically saying, listen, that encounter that Jacob had in Genesis 28, when he fell asleep, rested his head on a rock. We know Christ is the rock, right? He's the truth. He's the one we build the foundation of our lives upon. He has a dream and he sees a ladder going from heaven to earth and angels ascending and descending and on the top of the ladder. So people don't look high enough. They look for the manifestations. They look for the healing. They look for the prophetic. They look for the supernatural. But actually all of that is a sign and a wonder to cause your eyes to be fixed on Jesus when you see him rightly. Every touch you've had today is not about the experience. It's about leading you to the one who is life and life eternal, King Jesus. So that healing right there, the revelation isn't about an elbow and a word of knowledge. The revelation is Jesus still heals today and he doesn't even need us involved. Thank goodness for that. Yeah, amen. I, uh, I think that that is the fourth or fifth week in a row we've seen people healed when no one's prayed for them. That, for me, is the start of a move. I pray, Father, that that would just increase, that what you've started will come into full completion. I pray, Father, that in the weeks to come, as they come into your house, that healing will just begin to happen, that by the time they come and sit in their seats, what you are bringing into order, they will recognize that we will be able to give you praise and give the testament to your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Huh, okay, I had loads of thoughts and a lot of it is actually just starting to break out. So I was up at five this morning thinking, Anthony preached so well a couple of weeks ago, I need to put in a few extra hours just to make sure I was good. Uh, that's not true. Um, my heart is burning. Do you mind if we just flow with you for a little bit and just kind of pour out to you, just, just capture a hold of stuff. Um, have I got the Bible anywhere? I hope so. Is that my Bible? <laughs> Is it anointed? Chuck <laughs> 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 oil on it, just in case. Um, can you turn to me to Ephesians 1? That this will be on the board. So we'll loosely stick to what, what translation says? New King James. Thank you. Ephesians 1. Page 1023. So Ephesians 1, verse, let's go from verse 3 and we'll read down to verse 7. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined to us adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Wow. This is the same father where sin cannot be in his presence, so he sends his son to become sin, so that we can enter in. I know I've just said that, I don't understand it. Because the, the actual death of God himself being manifested in flesh, that sin cannot enter his presence, but he comes as a humble servant in flesh and as a righteous man who always did whatever he saw the Father do and only ever said what he heard the Father say, he was able to navigate life with all of the ups and the downs. You know, from the age 12, we see an account of Jesus and Joseph is around. We see him at the time of 30 and Joseph is never mentioned again. It's probably likely that his stepdad died. That's trauma. That's painful. But somehow he was able to navigate through that situation where his heart was still turned towards the Lord and never ever did he ever think that his father wasn't good. Even at the age of 12 when he went AWOL. I mean most of us would be thinking our kids are sinning. They've gone for what's probably his bar mitzvah ceremony at the age of 12 in a Jewish culture you became a man. And 
Uh, Mary and Joseph, as parents of the year, you're not going to see them on Pride of Britain show anytime soon, they start walking home and a few days later, as they're on the way back home, they realise Jesus isn't with them. I mean, social services, anyone? So they turn around, they go back to Jerusalem, another two, three days journey, and they just find Jesus in the temple, in the house of God, blowing the minds of all the religious teachers, and they're looking at him going... Jesus, we thought you were with us. Have you ever left like a kid in a supermarket or anything like that? You know, and you're probably so angsty that it comes across as anger, but really it's just sheer relief, right? I actually left my oldest daughter on top of the car once and somebody knocked on the window. We did actually drive off, but we're okay. So, but they're saying, Jesus, didn't you know? You, you, you're worried as sick. You're worried as sick. But he turns to him and says, don't you know that I'm meant to be about my father's business? There was a revelation that Jesus had at the age of 12 that actually, even though that there was natural order like family and responsibilities like work, because he was a carpenter, that actually he had a greater call and a greater awareness of another realm than the one that he was actually being raised in. And in the same way, we have been so conditioned to just go to church and go through the process, go to a life group, go to a prayer meeting, and we just add it onto our life rather than our life being completely turned upside down where he becomes the priority and everything else serves the purpose of the will of God in your life. And a lot of us are looking for, oh God, what do you have for me? And actually we aren't willing to make space for it and we just go, well, I don't mind doing missionary work, just make sure it fits in with my holidays. Or I don't mind having to sow into this, but you know, we've got a holiday booked as well. Or I want to upgrade my car. And none of those things are bad. The Lord loves to bless his people. But when they become the main thing, they become out of sync. And you go from being an eternal people who've been raised in Christ Jesus in heavenly places to becoming temporal people. And that's why people don't want to know the church is because they don't see any difference between us and then the gospel is to change and transform your life to such a degree that you are no longer a citizen of the world though you live in it that you are now a citizen of another kingdom and you have a new citizenship in Jesus name I don't know why but is there anyone here who's like applying for citizenship I don't know I just dropped him yeah is there anyone at all it might just be a thought that just came but I thought I'd throw it out there Anyone in the family at all who's going for it? Okay, no worries. So there is a new citizenship that we have. Now with a new citizenship, if you open your passport, that tells you if you've been a naughty boy or a naughty girl, what your rights are if you get to the embassy in time before the nation's police that you're in get you. It gives you rights. And this is the thing about Christ Jesus that he's raised us up. Why? Because he has brought us in as adopted sons and daughters. Now, if you know anything about American law, which I don't, I know this one thing, so I'm going to share it with you. If you are adopted in America, it is illegal for that adopted child to be cast out of the will. You can block your natural kids out of it, but anyone who's been adopted, they have legal rights that protect what is now right, rightfully theirs. And in the same way, when the Lord redeemed us by his blood and he didn't just leave us in the earth and go, right, now try and work out how this looks. He literally raised you up because your spirit man came alive. Before Christ, you just had your soul that traveled around in this body. And some will look nicer than others. But this soul is your mind, your will and your emotions. And I have got myself into so many dead ends and sticky situations by going how I feel or what I want to do. Not realising that when I said yes to Christ, I chose to die to myself. He died for me so I could die to me that I could then live in him. That's the point of the gospel, that you are no longer the same. So when you go into the waters of baptism, that old you, that old way of thinking, those habits, those cycles of behaviour, don't just representatively go into the grave. They stay in the water and then when you come out, you are absolutely brand new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That means all of the stuff that comes through your family line, the behaviour patterns, the ways of thinking, they are redeemed in our heartbeat. And the Lord is now discipling you, 
teaching you, training you on how to think as he thinks. Because if you think as he thinks, the world that you're seated in the heavenly places can be breaking out into the earth. That is the gospel. You are saved, redeemed, but it's not the end of the story. There is more that he wants. He wants the kingdom to flow through you, but he's trying to get resurrection power to you, but your old man still seems to be alive. I've been a Christian a long time. You would never have known it. I've made stupid mistakes. I've committed ridiculous sins. I've blown the doors off my own life many, many times by my stupid decisions. But let me tell you this. The day that I got truly real with God, everything started to change. Do I still have things in my mind where I think out of sync with him? Of course I do. I'm a man, but I'm committed to the journey of being discipled by the Holy Spirit that every single day that I engage in his presence, that contact experience with him, that I may know him, I am continually being renewed in my mind. Why? So that I can prove his perfect, good and acceptable will. What's his will? Jesus said, pray this, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. We've been singing that. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church is the doorway to heaven. It's where the kingdom of God is breaking out. People will come in and encounter the king of glory, but they go out completely different. And what they pick up from the house of God, they take out into the world. Why? Because Jesus Christ didn't just die for Christians. He died for the world. For God so loved the world. He loved Stoke-on-Trent. He loved Tunstall. He loved the towns. He loved the UK. He so loved the world that he sent his only son for every generation that's ever going to live before he returns. And how does he do it? He turns to his church and says, the same works that I did, you're going to do an even greater. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus is so humble that actually he reserved some miracles for his friends. Peter walking along because the anointing, he was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit that his shadow healed whatever it touched. You want to live like that? You want to ruin every funeral you ever go to? That's Jesus, by the way. You don't want to invite him. He'll upset you. He even ruined his own funeral. He got up three days later. Resurrection power. But resurrection power is only ever found on the other side of death. And you see, you die to yourself at the point of salvation, but there is a daily picking up of your cross. Not a woe is me, self-condemnation, but it's a choice that says, I'm choosing to turn my heart towards you, Father, that today is a day that the Lord has made, that new every morning are your mercies, and that there are opportunities everywhere I go, but I've been walking around with my eyes closed, and then suddenly they open. And you see opportunities where the doorway is opening between heaven and earth. We had it this week. I was out with someone and it just doesn't happen a huge amount of time. I was out with someone for a coffee and they were talking to me. And all of a sudden, they just, I mean, literally, it's like they just zoomed away. I could hear them still talking, but my attention was turned completely away because I saw somebody walking on crutches just had surgery and it was to the point where I felt like I was being a little bit rude sorry Jeff but a little bit rude but my my heart was being pulled to recognize something that normally you can have 15 people walk past me in crutches but my attention was caught and the opportunity for heaven to break in and I think Jeff was still talking I just got up like sorry Jeff I need to go and catch this guy and we just lay hands on the guy to pray that God would recover quicker than what the surgery said. Because for me, it's like just the faithfulness to just stick a hand out. It says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The faithfulness even to just recognize an opportunity then have the boldness to go for it in the middle of the cost of coffee. I tell you, this ain't about a pastor and it ain't about an evangelist. It's about the church of God doing the work of ministry. And he is marking you in atmospheres like this. So he breaks off the limitation so that you start to see what he sees because he has raised you up into heavenly places. There is no sky room above him. He is in the very top of all places. He's in the penthouse of heaven and he gets the peripheral view. He's able to bird's eye view everything and he's able, if we can, get his counsel and his wisdom and his power through us. But he's given us the access to do it. Access to spiritual blessings. 
Turn with me quickly to 2 Peter 1. Let's go from verse 2. Is this okay? He's trying to stir us up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I tell you what, this is my heart. We see more miracles outside of the church than we do inside. So that's where you spend most of your time. And actually what the Lord is doing, he is breaking off those dams. We had a picture earlier of like blockers, you know, when they're on the coastline where they stop the waves coming in because it floods the town and it's these man-made structures that go up and then they go down when they're happy with it. I just see God removing them. And it's almost like the church has been fearful of God being who he really is. But it's only in knowing who he is that you discover who you are. Because as he is, so are we meant to be in the world. That's why encounter is so important. Verse 2, 2 Peter, chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Contact experience with God, with Jesus, multiplies our understanding, our awareness and our experience of his grace huh. and his peace. That word peace, coming from, in the Old Testament, it was shalom, but in the Greek it has the same meaning of bringing divine order, that what is in heaven comes on the earth. The Jews say it all the time, every morning they'll speak to the family, they'll say shalom, shalom, and what it means is, Every obstacle in my way from having a straight run in the purposes of God are removed out of the way. Every little ditch gets filled in. Every mountain in the way gets lowed down. That sounds like scripture in Isaiah, doesn't it? God is bringing peace to us and actually the contact experience with his presence, turning our hearts and to engage with him actually multiplies the revelation of who he is in our lives. And if you see him, you can have him. Anything that you can see, you can have. And that's why the eyes of our hearts are being enlightened. The Holy Spirit is trying to cause us to see from heaven's perspective. So he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on things above. Why? Because if you can see from that perspective, you'll actually be able to do something down here. The lie that's being given, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. It is a lie. You can never be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. In fact, the earth needs more heavenly minded people because eternity is always at hand heaven is always at hand and faith just takes what is unseen and brings it into existence that's all it does it's calling th those things that aren't as though they actually were knowing that God has a supply for every single human problem on the planet so when you're there tomorrow I pray that Holy Spirit starts to switch on something in your thinking where you start to clock opportunities for you to step out in faith and in boldness that he can do his work in and through you. How amazing would that be? Fancy seeing some healing at the photocopier? Speaking a word of life that actually brings wisdom that saves a marriage tomorrow? What about the people who are going through grief that as you speak it's like a balm that is just soothing, healing and rest in that person? How about that? It's not all about people getting out of wheelchairs. The Lord is looking for us to be carriers of his light where people so enshrined in darkness and they can't see the wood for the trees. He's looking for people to stand on the hilltop and say, I've met the one who is the light of the world. Now because I've seen him, I've been transformed into light because whatever he touches starts to look like him. And so you get to go into those dark places, those situations, and you get to be the light of the world, the hands and the feet of Jesus. Your mouth can begin to speak the very word of God who is Christ himself. That's amazing. Let that multiply upon us. Verse 3. I'll do verse 2 again. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That should blow your mind. The very divine nature of God, when you were adopted, you took on his nature. You didn't just take on his name. 
You didn't just take on the benefits, you actually took on his nature that is resonant on the inside of you. We said it last week, Peter says that we have been born again by a non-perishable, an unperishable seed. That means nothing can destroy it. What happens to a seed? It grows. It's watered. It produces a harvest. And then that harvest carries seed. It falls to the ground. That seed is then watered. It grows. It then produces a harvest. That harvest then grows, drops its seed. There is a cyclical growth in the things of God that if we can just steward our encounters with the Lord, we will see more be released to us. There is increase coming. I keep saying to the guys, this building is too small for us. We've not even moved downstairs yet. Not because of the worship. There's nothing special about the worship without the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? It is just a clanging single. Single? Symbol. And maybe that's a prophetic word about having a music label. Who knows? <laughs> wow. Partakers of the divine nature have an escape to the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let me tell you this. The world doesn't want to know Jesus because they've seen carnal Christianity. Carnal Christianity, to be carnal, is to live out of the flesh and according to the ways of the world. And actually, Jesus was so separated from the ways of the world, he was able to say, Satan has nothing in me. There are no hooks. There's nothing that he can do to tempt me in order to draw me away from my father. And yet we've had people who have professed Christ but have been sort of dancing with the devil on Saturday night and trying to slide in next to God and putting a guilt offering in on Sunday morning. The guilt offering's done now, by the way. You don't need it. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Just say yes to him, but truly let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the devil. That's what the Bible says. And so this corruption of the world actually means um, that there is a wasting away of what should be Strong, healthy, full of vitality and life. And so when you have carnal Christians who they want to give their heart to Jesus to secure the golden ticket to heaven, but then still live in the ways of the world, it is still eroding the soul, the mind, the will and emotions. And that's why actually deliverance and freedom ministry needs to come to the church before it ever comes to the world. Because people are carrying little monkeys on their back because of carnal Christianity. Carnal Christianity is to think according to the ways of the world when we're actually being called to think according to the ways of heaven. You've been called to think eternal, not temporal. How do you view your life? What are you sowing right now? I've said already that what we're doing in Presence Church is setting up the next generation or even a generation that's not even born yet. We need to be doing that with our whole lives, intentionally living from the realm of eternity, not living for eternity. Eternity is here. Eternity is at hand. Heaven is at hand. And so this corruption of the world, we know that actually the influence over the world is the prince of the power of the air. It's Satan's kingdom. And yet the Lord hasn't just caused us to be saved and then just somehow work it through. He has raised us up into heavenly places with access to every spiritual blessing. Also weapons that aren't carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds that exalts itself up. Every thought, every idea, every so-called knowledge that exalts itself up against the knowledge of God is cast down with heavenly tools, heavenly weapons, heavenly blessings. And actually, we have been called to be the spiritual SAS, where we break people out of bondage, but we don't do it by earthly ways. You know, Trevor, who's going to be coming back in April, um, was our pastor in Revival Fires down in Dudley. And he used to watch people, and they'll be crying at the front of the altar, and the ministry team are hugging them. And it's like, stop hugging the demon, cast it out. <laughs> and I tell you what, we have... Seeker friendly, the church out of discernment. Oh, we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. I tell you what's uncomfortable, their life being oppressed. That's uncomfortable. And actually we need the true message of the gospel that is like an arrow that pierces into the very center of people's issues where actually the foundation can be replaced and they can be taken out of the miry clay that is taking them into a deeper and deeper prison and their foot can be put on a firm foundation. That firm foundation is called holy ground. 
set apart for the Lord. And so I think about the life of Jesus. What was so different about Jesus? How was he able to be fully human and yet never sin? It says that he was tempted in every way that we were. That means Jesus, you might not think, Jesus was tempted with lust. He was tempted with theft. He was tempted with addiction. In every way that he was tempted. And yet he was still able to stand strong in his identity in the Lord. If you think about the temptations, a small snapshot that we see in the wilderness, if you are the son of God, is warring against his identity. And in the same way, carnal Christianity, they don't realise it is a war against them being adopted sons of God who've been raised up above the standard of the world and they're now citizens of a greater kingdom. But all they need to do is just learn to walk it out. Think as he thinks and you start to walk as he walks. If you don't have joy in your life, the likelihood is is that you have a value that is out of sync with God's. We've been talking about how God has given us a vision, but now he's building the values of his heart so that we can carry the vision. Because I'll tell you what, some of you carry promises from God that if he gave it to you now, it'll kill you. It'll destroy you. And you might think, oh yeah, but God's blessing me. Yeah, but that actually might sedate you into some kind of complacency. What was it about Jesus? It says in Hebrews 1, it says that he loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness, which is the ways of the world. And God anointed him with joy more than any of his brothers. There was a joy in prioritizing the heart of the Father. There was a joy in celebrating in righteousness, right standing with God, that brings right thinking with God. And if you have right thinking with God, you can walk right with God, manifest in the kingdom wherever you go. This was the source for Jesus' joy. And in that place of joy, no matter what the enemy tried to do, it just reflected off him. Let me tell you this, I think the easiest gateway into the lives of people is despair. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So Isaiah 11.2 talks about the prophecy of Jesus And it talks about how the root of Jesse will have the spirit of the Lord that will rest upon him. And that there would be a spirit of counsel and a spirit of might. The spirit of the Lord enabled him to do the mission. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'll be able to set the captives free, etc., etc. Preach the kingdom of God. But the spirit of counsel is to be led by that ever-present voice of God in that contact experience with him being led to go this place or that, is how he ends up in the Lake of Gadarenes. There's a huge storm where he's asleep because he's full of peace, right? He is the Prince of Peace, but he's gone for a mission. Well, why would you go over a lake when you know there's a huge storm coming? Because he knew the counsel of the Lord. Why did he stop outside of a well with the Samaritan woman and prophesy to her heart that unlocks a whole city because he was being led by the counsel of God? What about the might? So he says about there'll be a spirit of might upon him, the dunamis power of God, God's ability flowing through him. And you need to know this. Jesus did no miracle as God. He did them all as man. Because he was completely yielded. He said that he laid down all of his glory, all of his rights to be God. And he came as a humble servant. That's why he needed to be baptized, to be numbered with sin and filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was a model for, on him, was a model for us. This life is possible. And he's made it so easy that he's even destroyed the power of sin and death over your life. So Jesus has the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom. But then it talks about how he had the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And then it says this, out of all of those, he doesn't choose the spirit of power, doesn't choose the spirit of wisdom or counsel. He says this, the spirit of the fear of the Lord was his delight. What's the spirit of the fear of the Lord? It's prioritizing his heart over anything else. It's saying no to everything that would violate your yes to him. And it's a choice. You still have free will on this side of the cross. And that's why you can receive Jesus, but you can still make a choice to live according to the ways of the world. But he is looking to raise up a royal priesthood 
who walk as kings in the earth. He is the king of kings. But he is not kings according to how you think in the world, but kings like him, who was the king of glory, who laid it down and came to be the greatest of servants, even washing the feet of his disciples. That is incredible. That is the great high call. That is how we start to see that all these things that pertain to life and godliness in the knowledge of him, the contact experience with him, that actually you cannot have too many encounters and we will be accused of being, you're just all about experience. 100% we are. Because he is a living God who is a father who engages with his children. If he wasn't, it would just be a weekend act. So the spirit of the fear of the Lord, I believe, is the revelation that's coming back to the church. I believe the awe and the wonder. When we say the word fear, that's not a, I'm scared of you. The actual word means to have awe and reverence for who he is. We see him so rightly, but it's a dynamic of the Holy Spirit. If you've ever read the book of Revelation, it talks about how there are seven spirits before the throne. That's Isaiah 11 talks about how there are seven eyes on the Lamb. It's the fullness of the Holy Spirit resting on him. Jesus said, if you come drink from me, in John 7, I think, or 4, it says that you will have rivers flowing through you. The river of the Spirit of the Lord, the river of counsel, the river of wisdom, the river of might, all the fullness of the Holy Spirit at your disposal. But he's discipling us. He's breaking off the limitations. And I tell you what, when we truly sow our lives in fully for the sake of his name, he will begin to move all of heaven through you. Isn't that incredible? Who's got a heart to see God do immeasurably more than you can ever ask or imagine? I am not asking God big enough, and I've asked for a building that's massive down the road. I ain't thinking big enough, because when God truly moves, truly, truly, which he will do, and we know he's moving, but when I mean... To the point where he awakens a generation, you won't find a building big enough. And I know that surely in the land of the living, my eyes will see the goodness of the Lord. He really will. So I want to finish on this. Actually, no, I don't. <laughs> this is and it isn't what you think. Where are we? Ah, oh, here we are. The Lord is looking to raise a people who are eternally minded, who will take hold of what has been freely given and live it out. <laughs> said this about Jesus, and we've said it already today, for the joy set before him, he enjoyed the cross. Jesus was only able to endure the cross in a temporal time. So we know there was a fixed time on the calendar. In the first century, Jesus actually died on a cross. It's not metaphorical. It wasn't an illusion. He physically died on the cross. But he had the lens of eternity for the joy set before him. Jesus is coming back. He's returning for his bride. And there's going to be a great wedding feast. And every single one of us is going to be able to hear the trumpet call. And if you're in the grave, you'll be resurrected with a new body. If you're still alive, you'll meet him in the air. That's the truth. He's coming back. But in the meantime, there is a mission that he's given us. To live from the realm of eternity. That we can freely give what we freely received. Which is another kingdom. It's not just about a message. It's not just about a laying on of hands, it's seeing the translation of people from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Everything we're trying to do here is with eternity in mind. This building, you look at, we're trying to do excellence, but it really ain't about the temporal. It's not about the colour of the paint or the signs or how beautiful they are. It's recognising that God has caused us to build a barn house that has an impact for the rest of eternity. And so I want to challenge your heart today to invite the spirit of the fear of the Lord to rest upon your life. It will shake everything. And it will be your delight because on the other side of that saying yes, where you again choose to lay your will down to him because you still have that authority. So one thing he can't take authority over is your will. 
It's a free will offering to the Lord. It's an act of sacrifice that you give to him that is an act of sacrifice of worship to him. Every time you say yes to him, it's an expression of the fear of the Lord, the awe and wonder of who he is, and it releases a joy upon you to do it. Some of you will enter your bank accounts and it'll be the happiest day of your life. And I ain't saying that thinking, oh, that's good for you. I've done it multiple times. And I tell you what, I might be looking thinking, I can't even afford a packet of crisps. But there is a joy that's resonant on the inside of you because I've heard the voice of the Lord and I've gone, oh, my yes to you is so greater than anything else that I would say no to. I'm just going to say, do you know what? Have all my yeses all the time. And in that place, joy starts to burst out on the inside of me. You may be going through grief right now. I may not be very happy. But joy will supersede that. Joy will actually start to steward your emotions so that even though going through trial and tribulation, and they will come, by the way, says on account of the word of God that you will suffer trials and tribulations. I tell you what, it only takes revival for you to start becoming the point of mockery. Just read the book of Acts. But there will be a joy that's on the inside of you because you know that you know that you said yes to him. I want to do two things, two prophetic activations. I, I believe massively in doing something. See, the prophetic is great. But you're not just a spirit. You're a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. And actually a house divided against itself can't stand. So it might be that your soul is warring against your spirit man. Your spirit man is entwined with the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of that is that the Holy Spirit can influence and lead your mind, will and emotions so that you're able to utilise your free will for the glory of God. James said this. He said, if you're in need of wisdom, ask for it. But don't ask in unbelief. Because that man won't receive anything. And in fact, he's unstable in all of his ways. That word unstable actually means two sold. In other words, that there is a clashing against each other of what you know to be true, but actually you're believing the news press of the world going, that's not possible. And you've got these two voices that was warring. So when you ask God to take possession of what he has already given you, there is another voice over here that's saying, that's probably not going to happen for you. Ask, believing that it's going to be given to you. And what unbelief is, is just us believing what is normal for the world over the word of God that he says is normal. That's all unbelief is. And so a man who is unbelieving is unstable in all of his ways, but he has called you to walk a steady and straight path in the things of God. But it requires us to be secure in the revelation of who he is, who he's called you to be and what you have access to. And when you can truly see it and truly live from the place of eternity... By allowing his word to come on the inside of you, by giving your resounding yes to the leading of the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives, we'll actually start to see who we were always created to be, which is as he is right now. This is the Jesus of Revelation 1, full of glory, face shining as bright as the sun, hair as white as wool, Feet and waist burnished like bronze. He has a sash that's going across him. He has a sword, a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. The very word of God. He is the picture of all authority and all power. That one, he says, now you are to be in the world. So let me end on this. I want us to do two things. I want to create a space for you may be to meet the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It may be a place where you just come and you posture your heart that says, I say yes. I truly say yes. And I let all that other stuff go. And watch what he does. Joy 
will flow through your life today. It will become your delight. But then I want us to do something much more practical. Matthew 6 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A physical act that releases a spiritual reality. That's the prophetic. And I want you this morning, whatever that is, to respond to one of those two things. For some of you, it may be I just feel like I need to respond just for that posture in myself, physically stepping out, a physical act that releases a spiritual reality. I am posturing my heart for the spirit, the fear of the Lord, and it's going to become my delight. For others of you, this thing of eternity is planting an intentional seed in heavenly places, recognizing that I'm doing a physical act that's going to release a spiritual reality. It's not about the money. You know that, right? But Jesus talks about money nearly more than any other thing. Why? Because he understood that there are hooks in this world that can actually cap what you walk in. Even though everything's being given to you, we have to take possession of them. And so I want to give that space. It might be none, it might be all. I really don't mind. It's between you and the Lord. It's not about a man. And so I'll put a basket at the front. You'll find that there are envelopes there. If you don't want to give, that's absolutely fine. Just be led by the Holy Spirit in this moment. There was a basket somewhere. Thanks. Thanks, mate. You'll notice on there as well, gift aid, all that stuff. I won't say any more than that this week. But I want you to do business with God. Remember, the knowledge of the Lord is contact experience with his heart. As and when you're ready, if you're someone who's just coming to give, it may be that you want to stand here. And I'm just going to come and say yes and amen over you. I'm going to come and partner with you because where two agree, it's going to be established. If you're saying today, I want to set my life facing the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that that river would flow through me, that it becomes my delight, that I would be so full of joy. Oh, that I would prioritize the heart of the Father over all things that my life, the testimony of my life is this, I only ever do what I see him doing. I'll only ever say what I hear him saying. And I know it's possible because they did it with you, Jesus. If that's you, I want you to make a move. I want you to posture your heart. I pray that all of eternity starts to burst out of this house, out of our innermost beings, in the name of Jesus. This is between you and the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ha. Ha. This house loves the righteousness of God. We thank you that your righteousness is a gift to us, that you have bestowed your righteousness upon us. Father, turn our hearts that we would hate what you hate. The works of darkness, you said this, Lord, that you were sent, that you would destroy the works of darkness, and you sent us out to do the same work. Father, I thank you for every single one of these seeds into eternity. Father, may the spirit of the fear of the Lord rest. I say yes and amen. May it be a fire in your bows in the name of Jesus. Ha. Huh. You know what, Anthony, I feel like the Lord is going to really start to bring a discernment to the emotions of the Lord. That you're going to be led by the emotions of the Holy Spirit. Not just looking at a word, but you're going to feel what he feels. 
and there is a compassion that's being birthed on the inside of you that at times will feel overwhelming but it's in those places that the river of life and healing and deliverance and freedom is going to flow so naturally out of you I feel like you're going to start to really walk in Matthew 9 verse I think it's 45 47 somewhere like this where it says that Jesus looked at the people and they were helpless and harassed and he had compassion upon them and he healed all of them and he set them all free father release lord the compassion the emotions the heart of the holy spirit in such a new deep way in jesus name may be a fire in his bones ha are we good we're good let me bless you let's stand up Father, I bless you. We bless you. We declare that you are Lord, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of glory, the one who is and was and the one who is to come. In the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are coming back, that you are the eternal King. I thank you, Lord, that this is a house of eternity right here, that we're not a temporal, carnal people, but we've been set apart made holy for the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. We just declare, Lord, that we will posture our hearts, that we will be led by you, that we'll only ever do what we hear you do or see you do. We'll only ever say what we hear you say. May your May your heart be a joy to us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that all those things, those guilt and condemnation things, they just fall to the ground right now in the name of Jesus. I declare over you that you are the adopted sons and daughters of the Most High, purchased with the blood of Jesus, that you truly are seated in heavenly places, and that you have access to every spiritual blessing to bring heaven's solutions to every earthly problem. I declare over you that he has already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness in the knowledge of him. I pray, Father, for an increased river of encounter with your presence that takes us deeper into the spirit of revelation that enables us to see you rightly as you are. And as we see you, what we see becomes in us experientially in Jesus' name. We bless them, Lord. Fling doors wide open for opportunities that they would release eternity in the temporal, heaven into earth, releasing light into darkness. We commission them out for kingdom mission in Jesus' mighty name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. God, give the Lord a round of applause. Yeah, you're worthy. You know, if you're a part of this house, we have a load of sign-up things. I fear my wife nearly as much as I fear the Lord. Uh, she did tell me if you're interested in serving in any of those areas at the back, we also have a school of evangelism coming up. Uh, so there's a sign-up sheet at the back as well. The notices will be on the board. So seven-week course, getting people out on the streets, moving in signs, runs and miracles for the sake of Jesus' name. That's going to lead into, on the 18th of May, an Equipping for Harvest conference where we're going to invite people in from outside of the city to really start to pour into Stoke-on-Trent. But sign up sheets at the back. I'll give more information on social media and next week. Don't rush off. Grab yourself a coffee. Connect with somebody. Be blessed. I can feel revival bubbling. <sighs> Who? Oh, okay. Hey, so we're going to do baptism soon. Yeah, so just said that uh, just as a sign, mine and my wife's name to, uh, to get baptized. Oh, amazing. Well, we're going to be doing a buying her a tank. Thank you for I'll let him know that it's up and coming. <laughs> You all right? Yeah, good one. Hey, we nailed it that time. <laughs> we got the clouds. Good <laughs> old man. Um, you just said um, about getting baptised. Yeah, yeah. We've actually got a baptism service coming up soon. Good, good. Can't well, remember well, the exact well, date, so I'll let you know. I need to know because I'm, I'm getting off. Let me find out for you.
Yeah, we're broke. I think we're going to have to go. Yeah. Sand beans. Okay. Because the amount of people. Jobs in the Egg and Egg place. Oh, no. And it's walking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I'd already nominated Anthony anyway. Tie in, maybe walk. Well, no worries. Well, how can we? It's got tie in, Annie. Well, we'll just do it. 17th of March. I'm down. There. Where are we? Yes. You're down. Brilliant. Right, what we'll do is, um, have we got your number? Yeah. Have you? Have you got, oh, my phone's up there. Have you got his number? Can you share the contact? And then what yeah, I'll do is I'll send you a ping you a text. But yeah, we we probably I don't know, I reckon we'll have about 10, 15 people. Yeah, there. Let's get so, involved. Let's get yeah, yeah. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll spend a bit of time. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't wait. I can't wait. I absolutely love baptism. Yeah, yeah. Favourite thing to do. Oh, well, that's really Outstanding. Good. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Amazing. Good man. Really good seeing you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I didn't, but. I think Lauren told him, yeah. At the end, yeah. Pretty sure they did. Yeah, yeah. It's on the record at the moment, so I'll go grab it and then get that sorted. Oi! Amazing. So well. That was really powerful that worship. Yeah, and my voice is like going again. So. Yeah, oh, oh, I can I can live in it. I really could. And we will. Yeah, I know. So good. I think he's I think he's building our in our endurance just to keep going. Yeah. Then you see like some people getting uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. It's like when she started singing, there was like another wave that just came yeah, in the room. And I was like, my goodness. Yeah. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He wants people to say Yeah. And I think she needs to get on worship. Well, she ain't here. She's from down south. Yeah, yeah. Never to us, no. She might have been to Greek. She's been to Greek. Sam's sister. So you would have seen her before, yeah. 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 But I, I met her when I, in my old church in Manchester, Freshfire. So we were, we got a mutual friend. We were both at the wedding. Yeah. So. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. She was brief. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, so good, love isn't it? it? Love it. I, I feel like it, it's just about to pop. It's not even gone yet. Yeah, it's not even gone yet. So. I thought the second song was good. Good job. To come on. Oh, yeah, I was just hoping I'd get on with. There's a song <laughs> yeah. that I couldn't get him back on. I was again. expecting Solitaire to come up as yeah. a <laughs> <laughs> If I had a map, it'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's I'll get you on that. Track. I'm not doing it again. Yeah. Joke. <laughs> signed up every week, mate. So, amazing. You're right, mate. You good? Oh dear. I'm roasting now, these eaters are too hot. So. Oh no. That's a good roasting. The week before, everyone was freezing cold. I couldn't even open my Bible, I had old man fingers. I thought, well, get these two eaters. I'm thinking, is that going to be enough? We've got four downstairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're down there next week. Have you seen it yet? Yeah, it's lovely, yeah, it's going to be ace. I think this is going to be an overflow room. Yeah. No, I know, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, you're right, mate. Thanks for helping the old boy out. <laughs> Saying that his grit has been in the back of his boots since he left here last week. I said maybe you should get him to testify that. Yeah, we will. We, that's, that's we share next week. Yeah, yeah. Beyond, yeah we'll, we'll open up with it. Just raise people's faith. It's really good that they get to see the story and we'll, we'll let you tell the story. So. If you come like about 10 o'clock next week, or even come for the pre-prayer, we do prayer from 20 to 10 if you want to, and then I can just sit through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I can just say like, this, this is how we normally do testimony. So what was wrong? How long was it? What was it like? What happened? And then what's it been like since? So you sort of give a bit of the story. So, and I can do it in a way where I can just ask you questions or you're happy just to free flow is entirely up to you so we'll we'll catch up in the morning like uh, Sunday morning so that's really good yeah. uh, I bumped into my feet I bumped into Paul and Donny just before Christmas mm. and the post office right yeah they, you know, 
since then, little things start and start and start. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. It'd be good to see them in life groups as well. We're going to launch them soon, which is me midweek. It's much more social and get to know people. It'd be good to get to know you. So, you know, I think Paul and Donna might have one. I'll have one. And there's some other bits and bobs around as well. So, well, there's a gentleman that spoke to me. Maybe it's the kind of blue creator. He's sitting in one of the booths. Oh, okay. I'm really bad. I always forget. Once people have moved. He's gone now. Oh, is he gone? Oh, okay. Standing in front of came to me and he said, Your name, Mark? Oh, um, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He said, Your name, Mark? Yeah. 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 Because that's interesting, because I had a word when you'd been in and I never released it about trauma from an accident. I just never gave it out. So when he told me last night, I'm like, oh, is that is that that? But I mean, God knows what he's doing, right? So I'm the disobedient one <laughs> who, didn't, who didn't give it out. But that, that's incredible. But I'd love you to tell the story. It's great. I don't think it's really not I got kept playing for a play football for uh, uh, like, uh, 17 years before the diagnosis, but the diagnosis to be spine. Right. Uh, 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 